morning. It's good to see you today. We're going to sing of God's power and His victory and His love today. Let's stand and rejoice. Sing these great old hymns together. I sing the mighty power of God. I sing the
learning the song, sing it. I'm owning my sorrow and getting my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in.
about the cross. Praise the King. Praise the 
Worship. Good morning, everyone. It is a joy to be with you guys, and I, I want to thank uh, Pastor Ted, my friend, for the honor of being able to share with you this morning. And I, I just want to encourage you. I, I've been a pastor 35 years until um, three years we were at a mission agency, but uh, the last year is the first year other than that that we've not been a pastor. I love pastors, and I love to tell a church how special their pastor is. And sometimes when you've had a pastor for a while, you may, you may take it for granted a little bit. Don't do that. Because uh, Pastor Ted has been, um, to me, an encourager, uh, of, a friend. He's a man of boldness but kindness. He's a leader that people look to all across this country. His, uh, his precious wife, Liz, has been an amazing encourager to my wife, Donna. You know, when we stepped out to be missionaries less than a year ago, she sought out Donna this summer at the Southern Baptist Convention just to check on her, make sure she was doing okay. Those are the kind of things that God really honors in a pastor and his wife. And so, so be encouraged by what God has given you and honor your pastor, and you've got great, great things ahead. Hey, I've, I've got great news for you. You are alive today in the days of the greatest spiritual awakening of history. You have lived to see the greatest revival in the history of the world. And some of you hearing me say that think whoever this guest preacher is is a nut. He's lost his mind. Because our culture is coming apart. Our, our nation is headed straight away from God. How in the world can he say something like that? And, and you would be right as well. Our culture is coming apart. Our nation is falling away from the Lord. But I want you to understand something. Right now, in this world, God is at work in ways that we have never seen. For instance, we estimate now, conservatively, that every day, 30,000 people are born again in the nation of China. 30,000 a day. That, that, that would be like every lost person in Pensacola coming to Jesus every single day. All right? We, we now have more born-again believers in China than they have communists. 
Just let that sink in a moment. And listen to this. We hear all the bad news about the Muslim world. Do you know that in the last 15 years, more Muslims have come to Jesus, listen to this, than in the previous 1,500 years? God is breaking loose in the Muslim world. Sometimes you don't hear about that simply because the missionaries can't tell those stories easily without getting people hurt or, or killed. But God is breaking loose all over the world. Here's the problem. You've got to get on an airplane to see much of what God is doing today. And about a year ago, God shook our lives up. As you've heard, we pastored a great church, a wonderful church, First Baptist Concord in, in, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. But the Lord uh, put an opportunity before us to lead an incredible ministry called Life Action Ministries, a ministry that's meant a lot to us for a quarter century, a ministry God has used for over 50 years. Uh, we have a, a, a camp that's full all the time, a family camp in Michigan. We have a lodge where we minister to, uh, to leaders and pastors when they just need a break and to catch their breath. And we have teams that are, are all over the country. They're training right now. We'll start sending them out in August to serve churches, to, to help churches to experience mighty moves of God. And we have materials. We do, do so many different things. But our simple mission is this, to inspire your next yes to God. If we were to see God's people, God's families, and God's churches simply beginning to say yes to him again, no matter what it is that he says, we too would see the great movement of God that we're seeing in the world right here in our country. God's not stingy. He's not changed. He's not going, you know, I'm sure enjoying sending revival across the world, but I just don't like those Americans much. He's not doing that. He's waiting to find if there's one. Sometimes he starts with just one. One today who will say your next yes to him. One young person, one man, one woman. He often uses people that, that, that the world thinks are either too old or too young or too this or too that. He's looking for one who will say yes. One family who will say yes. One church who will say yes. And he'll do great and mighty things. And God called us to leave our ministry to one church and to travel almost all the time and be a part of helping churches, especially in North America. We're, we're all, we go all over the world. And I'll tell you some stories today about what God is doing in the world. Because if God is moving in the third world, I want to know why and I want in on it. But the burden of my heart is to see the power of God move in the North American church again so I don't have to spend the rest of my life telling stories about things that happen somewhere far away. I want to see him work in my life, in your life, in your church, this church, right here. Why not today? Why not now? Why not this moment to say yes to God and see what he will do and how he will move in power right here in this place. And the title of this message is simply say yes. It's the most important thing you can ever do. It's more important than anything that's on your mind right now. More important than your finances. More important than your job. More important than even your family. It's more important than anything in your life to simply say yes to God in whatever he asks of you and whatever he's saying to you right now and whatever he says to you tomorrow and for the rest of your life. Everything changes when we say yes to God. You know, this, this blew me away. A couple of months ago, astronomers announced, and I, I, don't, I don't know if this is right. I don't know much about astronomy. It's interesting because of the creation that we see that God has made. Astronomers announced that they have an instrument in Australia which has heard, not seen, but heard the first stars ever created. Now, I, I didn't even know stars had anything to say, but apparently astronomers are listening to the sound of the first stars. Now, when I, when I heard that, I thought, I, I don't know anything about that. I don't know if that's real or true, but I do know this. We can hear from the one who made the first stars. We know him. We can, we can relate to him, and, and he will relate to us. If we want to, we can actually live like he's real. As I've traveled all across North America, my concern for the North American church is that we may have sunk into a routine 
where we think that Christianity is coming on Sundays because that's what you're supposed to do to be a, a good person and a good Christian and hearing somebody teach and learning more of the Bible and singing some songs and then going back to real life, you know, to the stuff that really matters, you know, our jobs and our families and our finances and our hobbies and all of those things. And, and I, I'm afraid that we are living like we're practical atheists. Like, like we really, we're really not sure that this stuff we say about God is really real. I have the greatest grandchildren in the world. Don't even try to argue with me. You'll lose. And um, <laughs> we've, we've just spent the most wonderful week when, uh, when Pastor Ted asked me to come. I said, man, that's, that's easy. We're going to be on St. George Island for a family vacation with our children and grandchildren. We'd be glad to, to come over. We just finished it yesterday. And I love listening to the things our grandchildren say. I have a little five-year-old named William, and he's brilliant. I mean, this kid is smart. Takes after his mother, thank the Lord, but he is great grandmother and mother. But, but he is a smart little boy and can tell you something, something about every planet in the solar system. And I was talking to him one day, and, and I said, so what can you tell me about Venus? He said, it's very, very hot. I said, okay. I said, what can you tell me about Jupiter? He goes, it has a big wet spot on it. I said, whoa, that's pretty cool. I said, well, I went through all the planets. And I said, well, well William, do you know anything about Earth? And he said, Papa John, that's where I live with my mommy and daddy and keep all my stuff. I said, well, yeah. And then he said, Papa John, what planet are you from? <laughs> and it made me laugh. And then it made me think. Because you know what? A lot of times I live like my, like my roots are right here. Like I'm stuck right here. I'm not from here. Neither are you. This is not our final home. We're in preparation right now for forever. And I don't want to live like all the stuff that won't matter in a thousand years are really the things that matter the most. We know the one who's created the stars, the planets. And to know him as life is everything. To know him, not as religion or as our church, but as life. To hear what he says and say yes, that's everything. Now, I want to turn just for a moment. This is not our primary passage. I just want to read to you Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. I just want you to hear this. Because I think in the North American church, we've largely stopped living like we believe that this is what life is meant to be. So I want you to listen to this, and I want you to ask yourself the question, do I believe this? And if so, do I live with this as my worldview? Do I live, really live, like this is my life? Listen to this. Paul says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. We all draw our name from, from him. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Why? So that... Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, listen to this, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, all God's people, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, to know a love you can never fully grasp. Why? So that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. Wow, th this is what your life is meant to be. This is what you were remade for. You were born again for this life. And if you think that's kind of uh, mystical and spiritual and doesn't really impact the real stuff of daily life, listen to, it, to, the, to the next two verses. This is my life passage, by the way, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly then all that we ask or think, it's almost impossible to translate. It's, it's like to, to do super abundantly more than anything we could ever dream. According to the power at work within us. Do you live that way? Like a power that is available to do more than you could imagine? I can imagine a lot. God says there's power in me and in you to do more than I can even imagine. To him be glory. To him, not me. That's my daily prayer. I don't live it out all the time. My daily prayer is that he'll increase and I'll, I'll decrease, that I'll just be his servant, that his name will be known, not mine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. How long? Just in your short time period? No, through all generations, your children, your grandchildren. You're meant to change the generations forever and ever. Your life is meant to have eternal significance. And then God says amen. You know what the word amen means? It means yes. 
God says, this is the life I mean for you to have, and now I speak my yes over it. Do we live like we really believe that? Our daughter, our little granddaughter rather, we try to drill this into our children and grandchildren. We try to drill into them that this is the way we're meant to live, that we're never meant to have a boring day, restful days, but not boring days. Because this God we serve is the creator of the stars, the king of the universe, and is filling us, pouring into us life and power and strength. And we can live in the midst of that. If we want to. So we, we try to inculcate this into our family. And it was so thrilling to us when our little four-year-old granddaughter Addie was saying her, her prayer uh, one night at the vacation this week. And she said, she said, God, would you please do more than we can ask or imagine here at the beach this week? We said, yes, yes, that's the way we're meant to live. All right, now, I want to show you our key passage for the day. I want to show you a story in the Bible, really a whole book in the Bible, we'll touch on on some parts of it, called Haggai, where we see God calling his people to a say-yes lifestyle, to a lifestyle lived like he's real, like he's everything, like he is life itself. So open your Bible to the book of Haggai, and uh, that's a little bit of an obscure book. It's between Zephaniah and Zechariah. So if you get to that section, you should be able to find it. If, you, if you're new to the Bible, hey, we're glad you're here. That's exciting. Tell your neighbor. Your neighbor can help you find it. But we're, we're going to read some from this incredible little book. And while you're get going there, let me explain the background of this book. The year was 520 B.C. And God's people, the nation of Judah, had, had been in captivity for a generation. They, the Lord had told them they would. They had departed from him. He had sent them into discipline and judgment. And they were captives in Babylon for, for a generation, for 70 years. And, 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 and then uh, the Persians freed Babylon, freed them. And they were free to go back home to Jerusalem. Guess what? Almost nobody went. You know how easy it is to become comfortable in slavery? To live in a life that God did not intend you to live, all bound up. But it's just so comfortable now to you. You've gotten used to it, and it's hard to break out of it. That's what happened to the people of God. And the people that did go back, they immediately began to invest in their own lives and began to build their own suburban neighborhoods. And at that point, Jesus hadn't come. The Holy Spirit hadn't come to live in the hearts of of those who accept Jesus. And, And so the dwelling place of God was the temple in Jerusalem, and it's ruined and wrecked. And everybody's just building their suburban neighborhoods. And that's where we come to Haggai chapter 1, verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. So he's speaking truth to the government leaders. And to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So he's, he's also speaking truth to the spiritual leaders. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people, those who have returned, say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. We got, we got other things we got to do first. We've got our own lives. That's what they were saying. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Or some translations of this difficult Hebrew phrase say with pockets, with holes in them. You're walking around and you keep stuffing stuff in there and it all keeps falling out. All right, so we, we want to learn from this call of God to his people to, to live a lifestyle, a, a worldview that, that actually appears to believe that he's real, this say yes to God lifestyle. What are some principles we learn from this passage? Here, here's number one. Saying yes to self never satisfies. Saying yes to self never satisfies. You, you know, you can see the spiritual darkness and blindness all over our country right now. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, it's not hard at all to look around and figure out, wow, you know what, having all the money you want, all the sex you want, all the drugs and alcohol you want, all the freedom you want, 
doesn't seem to satisfy, does it? Since now we're in a new suicide epidemic, and it's not just young people killing themselves, the, the fastest growing group of, of suicide, of people killing themselves, are middle-aged men, people my age, who are going, whoa, what happened? This is not the life I thought it was. I don't even want to live anymore. And those that are the richest and the most famous and have everything that we think will satisfy us, they are filling up our rehab centers and our cemeteries. This is not rocket science. Satisfying self, saying yes to self, to our own self-satisfaction, never, ever works. But we keep on going after it. Maybe it'll work for me. Maybe, maybe I'll be the first one to figure it out and it'll all work for me, and it never does. Saying yes to self never satisfies. So the word of the Lord comes to the people of the Lord and says, look, while you're over here hammering and putting up your, your beautiful panels, I've seen some of those panels, by the way, when you go to the Holy Land, to that part of the world, and you look at the ancient thousands of years old building, they, they had all these mosaics. They're so beautiful. And, and most of them right now are buried under rubble. We found a few of them, but those beautiful paneled houses in the ancient world, most of them are just buried under rubble. They don't mean anything to anybody anymore, but there was a time when people, ooh, this is, this is life. We have arrived. We have achieved. And God said, no, 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 no. No, I'm your life. I'm your life, and I want you to give yourself to me as life. Otherwise, you're going to keep living like there's holes in your pockets and everything just keeps slipping away. Now, when you live to satisfy self, Something happens that doesn't make sense to us, and, to, and we just watch it, and we're watching it grow all across our country. It, it, it's kind of counterintuitive, but here's what happens. We begin to become victims of fear. All right, when we live to satisfy self, we're supposed to be more free and more happy, but we become more afraid. You should have my wife come sometime and do a women's conference. She teaches an incredible, incredible teaching about how fear is just captivating women and, and holding them captives today. And it's not just women, it's all of us. We're afraid of everything. We can't send our kids to school without being afraid they're going to be shot. We're afraid that the economy may collapse. We're afraid of what the government might do or, or not do. We're afraid of, of terrorists. We're afraid of the climate. We're afraid of everything. See, because when we're, when we're living to satisfy self, there's always that fear that what we're holding on to so tightly is going to slip away. Somebody else is going to get it, or we're not going to have it I anymore. And you know what? We're right. <laughs> we're right to be afraid when we're seeking to satisfy ourselves, because it never works. Never works. So why are the happiest people on earth in the persecuted church today? I've made a decision. I mean, my, my primary burden is the North American church. That's the ministry I, I lead. I, I told Life Action when they asked me to become their president, I said, only if we will also become international so we get to go and see what God is doing in the persecuted church and take that message back to the North American church. You know why it's so important? Because in the persecuted church, they don't have any hope of satisfying themselves. They don't wake up in the morning and go, ooh, maybe if I work hard, I'll get a better job. No, they've, they've lost their jobs because they've come to Jesus. They don't, they don't work, wake up in the morning and say, hey, maybe in 10 years from now, I'll have a really good retirement nest egg. No, they know that they're probably are going to be in jail or dead in 10 years from now. So why is it that I've got to go to the persecuted church at least once or twice a year so that I can be in the midst of the greatest joy that I ever see in the world? Because they have learned the secret that only Jesus truly satisfies. And they've just given themselves to that. They've given themselves to him. And everything that they were afraid of holds no grip on them anymore. They still face fear, but they're not controlled with it. You know why? Because they're more astonished by God than they are afraid of the world. And we've got to return to that. We've got to return. We must become more astonished by God than we are afraid of the world. When that happens, nothing can stop you, nothing can hold you back. I'm very careful about telling stories that are coming out of the persecuted church today for two reasons. One, uh, sometimes we hear stories that turn out not to be true. So I'm only telling stories that I'm personally involved in or know the people involved or know the missionaries very, very well. Also want to be very careful that we don't endanger anybody or endanger movements of God that are happening right now. In my mind, the most humble, courageous heroes on the face of the earth today are our missionaries in the persecuted church who are often seeing the greatest revival in the history of the world and they're a part of it and they're helping it happen, but they can't tell anybody about it. Absolute heroic humility. 
But I want to tell you one of these stories that I have permission to tell you. This story took place through a friend of mine. We don't speak the same language. We've only spoken through interpreters. But this is one of the greatest men that I have ever known. He has seven bullet holes in him where he's been shot through the years. He witnesses to men by opening his shirt in the Muslim world and saying, this is what you've done to me. Now let me tell you why I love you anyway and share the gospel. He is, he's, he's asked me to pray over him a fatherly blessing because he says, I'm going to be Stephen. I know that I'll die one day, and I don't want to die without, without a fatherly blessing being prayed over me. This is one of the most amazing human beings that I have ever met, and he shares the gospel everywhere he goes. But he will tell you that he's met somebody far more courageous than him. You see, he was preaching one day some time ago. I won't won't talk about exactly when, so we don't identify it too carefully, too closely. But he was preaching in a, in a very fanatical Muslim area. And as he finished the sermon, a man with a big black Muslim beard came running up to him, and my, my friend thought, this is it, I'm going to heaven now. But the man came to him and said, no, I'm not going to harm you, but you used a name, a name. He had used a name he really didn't use often in preaching. It's the Arabic name for Jesus, not the name in the Quran, but the word that Arab Christians use for Jesus. And he said, who is this man? He said, I've been having a dream. And in my dream, the man says, I am this name. And, I, and, I, I, and he's glowing white. And he says, come follow me. And my friend took this man, I'll call him Hasim, took Hasim aside and shared the gospel with him. And in a very long story, led him to faith in Jesus. And Hasim said, this is wonderful. I've lived all my life with hate. Now I have love. Now I have joy. I must tell everyone. And he became an immediate evangelist, telling his family and his friends of the good news of the one who had set him free. And the death threats began. And he came to my friend one day and said, I've, I've been reading the Bible. I'm not baptized yet. Tomorrow you will come to my home and baptize me. I've invited all of my neighbors. We, we have a, a big tub we put in the middle of our home. You will baptize my wife and me tomorrow. And my friend said, I, I, I can't do that, Hasim. They'll kill you, they'll kill your wife, they'll kill me. And Hasim hung his head and he said, well then, I must love Jesus more than you do. <laughs> and he finally he said, if you won't baptize me, I'll have to baptize myself. Can you do that? My friend said, all right. He showed up at his house the next day. There were 30 pairs of, of sandals outside. And when he walked in, there were 30 angry, black-bearded Muslim radicals sitting on the floor and watching as Hasim took my friend and embraced him and brought him behind the tub. And he got in the tub and he shared his testimony. And then he, he sat down and my friend with trembling hands said the, the words that we have often heard and that we experience ourselves when we go through the waters of baptism. Maybe we really don't hear them though he said buried with Christ in baptism unto death and raised up to walk in a new life he got out and embraced his wife his wife climbed it this was radical revolutionary and she said this is a Jesus home now and she was baptized and then they began to share the gospel with everyone in the region and Hasim lived just a couple of weeks after that before they cut his throat here's one of the reasons you need to know this story because you're a Southern Baptist church, your giving is paying for the missionary salaries and for the money they are spending to minister today to Hasim's wife, who is a vibrant follower of Jesus to this day. But less than a year ago, almost a year, about right about now, my wife and I were able to go back to that region and I could not wait to talk to the missionaries to hear if we knew anything that had come from the martyrdom of this one man who was more astonished by God, more in love with him than he was afraid of anything, even death itself. And I sat with the missionaries and they said, we, can't, we have not been able to wait to tell you this story. And as they told it, we talked about how I would tell it in America and how to guard this story carefully. Let me tell you what they found. They carefully and courageously went back into the region sometime after Hasim's martyrdom. They knew of no believers left in that region, and they certainly didn't expect to find any. But these missionaries, with excited joy, said to me, Pastor John, you need to know, when we went in, we found 26. They said, not 26 Christians, 26 churches. 
every one of them pastored by a Muslim who had come to faith because of the martyrdom of one man, every one of them who have now been buried with Christ in baptism, old life buried, new life risen again, and now they're sharing and baptizing others, and the gospel is exploding in that part of the Muslim world through one man more astonished by God than he was afraid of the world. Now, what about us? I mean, it's pretty unlikely that any of us are going to be killed for the gospel. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe it's coming to our country too. I don't know. But is it possible that we could live a life that is so astonished by God, so in love with him, actually believing what he tells us life is supposed to be for us as followers of Jesus? Is it possible that we could live free of all the fears that are binding up so many people in our country? I believe it is. I, I, I believe it is. How does that happen? Write this down. This is important. Saying yes to a holy pause changes everything. Saying yes to a holy pause changes everything. All right, in Haggai, the, God, the prophet Haggai, that God speaks through him and says, tell my people, tell my people, they need to stop. They need to stop living a life that satisfies themselves and they need to consider their ways. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. This is the second time he says this. He just said it in verse 5. Consider your ways. Now he says it again. Consider your ways. The word consider means to stop and to meditate, to truly take a holy pause and think about how you're living your life. It is astonishing to me that many believers, many marriages, families, churches, Go years and years and years and never just consider, I've got to stop and take a holy pause and consider how I'm living. And, and I, think it's, I think it's one of the main reasons the church in North America is in such a mess. That's one of the main things we do at Life Action. We, we bring in teams and we, we take everything, the preschool, children, students, worship, teaching, everything, so that everybody, pastor, staff, and leaders can go and take a deep breath and pause and together say, Lord, we're stopping all of our activity for just a few days to say, what are you saying to us we want to hear and say yes? What about you as an individual? You know, we'll, 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 we'll take a pause and pay for a golf lesson, I do this, to learn how to take a stick and hit a white little golf ball better. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll take a pause and go to a conference to learn how to make more money in our job. None of those things are going to matter in a thousand years. Can you imagine standing before God at the judgment one day at the Bema seat? You know, I'm preparing a message right now on the two judgments and the last tears in heaven. We won't be at the great white throne, but there's going to be a Bema seat judgment of how we lived our life. Maybe the last tears in heaven will be wiped away there when we realize what could have been. Can you imagine saying, Lord, I, you should, boy, did you see my golf game there? I, how much I improved? Lord, did you see how much money I made? I, it, it all sounds silly, but we live that way so often when God is saying, just stop. Take a holy pause. I, I, twice a year, I get away alone. Some of it sometimes with a spiritual coach just so I make sure I am hearing from God. And then periodically, I just, I, I've just i got to take some time today, and i got to go up in the mountains and just be alone. You say, I don't have time for that. You have time for what you decide you have time for. And you do not have time not to consider your ways, not to take a holy pause. You know, most marriages never consider their ways. Why are our marriages coming apart? We, some, Don and I are writing a book right now. We almost lost our marriage years ago. We, we write about what we call valiant marriage, fighting for your marriage. We rarely take a holy pause and say, how are we really doing? We somehow think our love is going to stay, stay strong. We don't do any of the things we did when we fell in love in the first place. And the worst, the worst thing about not having a holy pause for your marriage, men, I want to aim this at you, is leaving your wife and children, grandchildren unprotected. Do we, do we believe what we read in Ephesians 3? Do we believe this great and mighty God will fill us with his power? Well, man, let me ask you, if your wife calls you tomorrow, you're at work, maybe, and your wife calls you and she goes, help, help, somebody's broken into the house. I think he's going to click. What are you going to do? You're going to say, man, if I, if, I wasn't, if I didn't have a birdie putt right now, I'd go home and help her. Or if I wasn't in this very important business, you won't do any of that, right? 
You'll be calling 911, but if you beat the police there, you'll kill him if you can. Bare hands, knife, gun, baseball bat, you won't care because a man protects his wife, right? Men, we have been given spiritual authority to come against the enemy who is destroying our homes, destroying our families. There is an enemy. He has broken into your home. He's coming after your wife, coming after your children, coming after your grandchildren. And very few men in this place, if we were really honest, ever put your hand upon your wife and pray a prayer of supernatural protection over her. We'll pray at the dinner table. Maybe we'll pray with our kids before we go to bed. In other words, we've taken the God of mighty power, the Lord of hosts. By the way, that means the Lord of angel armies. And we've reduced him to a dinner time and bedtime ritual. And God is saying, men, get to your wife today and say, you've had the last day of your life when you won't be prayed over by your husband, protected spiritually by your husband. That's a holy pause where you stop and say, where are we in this marriage and what can I do about it to say yes to God? What, what, what about your own life, your church, your family? Have you stopped to consider your ways? Is Sunday a holy pause for you or just a routine and ritual? What if you came in here every Sunday and say, Lord, I'm pausing today to hear your voice, and whatever you say, my answer is yes. Oh, the joy, the power that would come back to your church, to your family, to your life. I was in the Middle East several years ago, and a part of what we've tried to do is take pastors who are suffering, persecuted, family members dying, and take them to a safe place if we can and pastor them. We give them a holy pause. And what we have seen is beyond almost anything that my wife and I have ever experienced. And this particular time, I was on my own there. And the first several days were so hard, ministering to these pastors and letting them just, just share about the, 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 the death and the loss of people that they love. And they began to realize that, that they, had, they had become a little dependent upon their own self. That in the loss and persecution they were facing, they, they were starting to step into their own strength. And they had to have a holy pause. And as, as we came to the end of the time together, I was in my room about midnight, and I began to hear these loud bangs and, and this whooping and hollering. And I thought, oh, no, we have, we have been found. This is it. I'm going to heaven. And I, I threw on clothes, ran downstairs, heart pounding threw the door open, and there was my interpreter, tears coming down his face. And all across the room, the noise I heard, they had picked up makeshift drums. They were pounding drums. They were singing, they were shouting, and they were dancing. And I said to my interpreter, what is going on? And he said, life, Pastor John. Joy, Pastor John. He said, here in this part of the world, when there's joy, there's dancing. They just dance to Jesus. And he said, these folks have not had joy in a long time, but they've paused to be with the Lord, and he's restored their joy. And, and it was so amazing. They danced for hours. I joined in too. Thank God there's no video of that. But it, it, it was so remarkable. And I thought, God, I don't want to go through my life, the routine of all the stuff of life, and not take a holy pause to say, oh, Lord, restore our joy Restore the joy of our salvation. You know what happens when you say yes to God? This is pretty wonderful. When you say yes to God, God will say his yes over you. Yeah. Look, look at what happens in verse 12. The governor Zerubbabel, the priest Joshua, and all the remnant of the people, they obeyed the voice of the Lord. They just said yes. All right, Lord, you're right. We've been concentrating on ourselves. No, Lord, it's you. You're our life. Yes. And it says they feared the Lord. They didn't have to fear the world anymore because they became astonished by God more than they were afraid of the world. And so in verse 13, Haggai, the Lord spoke through him, and the Lord said, I'm with you. Yes, I'm speaking my yes over you. And verse 14 says they were stirred up. They rebuilt the temple. It was glorious. It was wonderful. But, you know, even the temple itself was temporary. It would come down to one day. But you know what's not temporary? The eternal results that God always brings when we say yes to him. In chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I'll shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I'll shake all the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Do you know that if the people of God had died out in their own self-satisfaction, 
the ancestors of Jesus would have died out and we wouldn't have had a savior. Here we are now. All the nations have been blessed by the glory of the Lord when his people said yes to him. It wasn't just the building of a temple. It was the building of the kingdom of God. And you are meant to be a part of that too. When you say yes to God, he says his yes over you. So here's maybe the most important question of the day. What will you do with the temple? Remember, the temple's not a building anymore. The temple is you. The temple is your one life filled with the Holy Spirit with a chance to say yes to him. What will you do with the temple, with your one life? Here's some action points to consider. Say yes to Jesus as your life. Begin really really considering if you're living as if he's your life, not your religion or your church. And then number two, say yes to time with him. Set aside those holy pause times. Do it. Think it through today. Don't wait. And And then finally, say your next yes to him now. What is it? For some of you, it's it's to meet him personally today. You may not even know how. Well, we got folks that'll tell you how today. For some of you, it's to say, this is my church home. This is where I belong, and it's time for me to make that decision. For some of you, it may be very specific. The Lord is whispering to you, break that affair off. Stay with your wife. For some of you, he's saying, put your hand on your wife tonight and pray over her in your marriage like you've never done before. Say yes. To some of you, he's saying, it's time for you to be used in somebody else's life and don't keep Jesus to yourself anymore. When's the last time, when's the last time you share the gospel with somebody? Do you know, right now, the, the state of, of small groups and Sunday school and Southern Baptist Convention is collapsing. We're losing millions of people. And, and a part of the reason is most of our groups and classes have gone years without one person coming to Christ. And everybody's pretty much okay with that. Because our friends are in there and we get to have fellowship and that is not the gospel. Are you broken hearted? If you've got a class or a group or a Bible study and you don't remember the last time God brought somebody to Jesus through your group? What if your next yes to him is to say to your friends, we've got to get out of self and start caring about those who don't know Jesus. I don't know what your next yes is, but he does. And if you're ready to say it, because I think you probably do too. There's no limit on what he will do in you and through you.